Hello, and welcome to Data Unchained. This episode of Data Unchained is going to be focusing on how partnerships and innovators like Seagate Technologies are helping to free data from some of the constraints that it's historically lived within and make it much more available to the users, the applications who are trying to innovate with it. I'm really excited to have today's guest, Eric Salo. He's the VP of Seagate Systems Business Segment and has a long history in our industry and then, of course, within the strategies within Seagate. So welcome, Eric. Thanks, Molly. Would you tell us just a little bit about yourself? I know I gave a bit of a summary, but give us a little bit more of your background, both at Seagate and maybe prior to Seagate and insights that you're bringing into Seagate in your role today. Sure. Well, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a long-term nerd. So I started out, my first job was in the tape industry and uh, it was great. I was, you know, I was in college and I got a, an internship and they said, look, this is a great place to start your career. Uh, quarter inch cartridges. It was a verbatim tape corporation. And they said, this is a great place to start your career, but you know, in three or four years, tape's really going to be gone. And you know, you're going to need to move on to something else. So, you know, welcome, but you know, you know this will, this will be a short-term stop. And of course, you know, that was 30 something years ago and we're still doing tape. Uh, so I, I worked in tape, tape storage for a while. And then I moved to the chip world, uh, a national semiconductor, AMD, a uh, good run at AMD. I really, what a great company. And uh, you know, I was there when we introduced the first 64-bit chip and that was you know really good times at that, at that time. And then about 10 years ago, I joined Seagate and Seagate's just been a, a, a rush because, you know, from the outside, it, it's easy to think, hey, you know, they make hard drives. Is that is that exciting? Oh, my gosh. Like, there's two things that are just amazing. One is the technology that goes into these disks is is just shocking, right? Like, it's even hard to get your head around. You know, we're, we're thinking about, you know, densities approaching a million tracks an inch. And, you know, the, the flatness of the disks is, is incredible. You know, just really amazing things going on. That's one. And then... During the time that I've been here, we've seen this revolution in data, right? We've seen a revolution, you know, going from the scale up architectures that I was really familiar with in my beginning part of my career to now most of the data is, you know, deployed on scale out, big cloud architectures and things like that. And, you know, all the changes that are associated with that and the changes of how to how data is is used has just been amazing. So it's been a really, really fun ride and I've had a great time. At Seagate. You had gave me an interesting bit of trivia that I think would be worth sharing with this group. You held up when we were first com- talking about this podcast, a business card, and said, do you know how many tracks can sit on the edge of this business card? I thought that was really interesting. So for the audience, think to yourself, what do you, when you hold up a business card and you think about innovation just in disk drives, how many tracks? Yeah, there you go. I'll get the exact number wrong, but so just on the very edge of this business card, this is a business card from uh, you know, just a regular you know, thick stock business card. How many, how many tracks do you think fit on the edge of that? Just put a number in your mind. It's about 5,000 in these new in these new drives, right? It's just amazing the density that we're getting to. You know, we have, uh, we're testing now 30 terabyte hard drives in our labs and, uh, you know, they just keep getting bigger. It is, it is it is really neat technology. So I know when I first joined the industry, I also came in through the tape world, um, but we were at quarter inch tape when I joined over at Spectrologic. Me too, me too, quick, quick. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Quick. I was on the quick committee in 1990 <laughs> <Perfect>. something. <laughs> And, you know, there was a lot of conversation about would the density of disk ever catch up with tape? And, you know, there was always kind of a race at that device level of the density of a specific device. And that innovation, I think, has accelerated beyond what any of us would have expected in SSDs and disks and tapes. And and that's really interesting. And we've thought a lot about Moore's Law and have we reached the limits of Moore's Law. Um, And, you know, I think for... Our industry, we often need to innovate at the device level to be able to store things as they grow faster and faster. But I think it would be worth just talking a little bit about why does it matter? Why does it matter that a device can store so much in such a small place? Why should someone care? Well, that's really the revolution. That's a good question. And the way the way I look at the at the at the at the problem statement is like it's not. It's not as interesting that people are making more data. We are making a huge amount of more data. Uh, we're doubling every three years, and it's just every every doubling is just a, almost an unconceivable amount of data. That, that's not the big story, though. The big story is that we're using more data, and you know, as we get these huge data sets, people are teaching computers how to look into the data sets and get things that are that are valuable. Right, valuable insights, things that are things that you can make money doing, and it's changed. It's changed the changed the use of data. You know, data used to be an expense. It used to be your IT department would have to pay so much money to store certain data that you just felt like you had to store, and that was just on the on the debit line and the in the balance sheet. 
now it's on the profit line. Now that if you have a data set, you can monetize it and you can get all these cool insights. And, and it's happening in every industry, right? It's not in one place. Literally, it's like a almost like a Cambrian explosion of of cool insight that we're getting from these bigger data sets that people are able to mine now. Anybody who listens to this show knows you're a device manufacturer and probably knows a little bit about your systems business, maybe a lot. But can you talk, just give us a quick summary of for the overall systems business, which you um, are overseeing, what all does that include? We ultimately make, uh, make systems that hard drives go in. Uh, hard drives and SSDs also. We also make SSDs. And, you know, for the longest time, we, we've, we've been a big player in this market for a long time, but for the longest time, you couldn't buy a product directly from us, right? So we would sell only to the OEMs. And, you know, if you bought a storage array in the last, I don't know, 25 years, there's a really good chance you have a Seagate storage array in your in your data center. I was I was actually out at some uh, at some uh, big company the other the other day in uh, in Hollywood. And, and they said, yeah, we haven't, we haven't really heard of Seagate. I'm like, well, let me, we were in the data center. I'm like, well, let me just, let me just show you like that one's ours that one's ours that one's ours that one's ours we've been making this we have a more than a million systems out in the field and um in the last couple of years we've actually launched our own direct branded business and that's been that's been doing just great so you know we um you know, we look at the the storage system as a system, and one of the things that's really important is as these drives get bigger and bigger, the systems that they go into become more important, and you have to think about them, and you have to design them together in a more careful way. So in your branded business, you have storage systems and a cloud. You have live cloud as well. Can you talk just a little bit about the cloud component? And where I'm, where I'm kind of leading towards is we were thinking about making data a usable asset. Part of it is um, making it cost effective enough to store the data so that you can gather insights. And I think what Seagate's doing with Live, because you are a manufacturer and you're able to use your own components in a branded cloud as well, is super interesting. I think it'd be worth talking a little bit about that. The way we look at our job is we want to securely protect and store your data, right? That's what we want to do. We want to, we want to be able to to take the data that you create and that you want to monetize and we want to cost effectively and safely store it, right? That's the way we think of our, of our job. And, you know, in, 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 in many ways, that's, that's, we'll, we'll sell hard disks to, to you or to some company that you do business with, with cloud, for example, or OEM. Uh, we also sell systems. And of course, we also sell storage as a service in, in live cloud. And the whole idea is that we want to make it easy for you to collect and keep data so that you can make money from it. That's our job. As you think about, the evolving architectures at the system level, um, scale up, which I think all of us worked in for quite a while, was really interesting as we moved to be able to scale out of a server into a rack. And then we wanted to be able to scale out to multiple racks or even into cloud inf infrastructure. Kind of where do you see the system level architectures? Where are they today and where do you see them evolving over the next few years? For the people that don't that don't live this every day, the idea of scale up is that all your data is kind of in in let's call it a rack. It's not exactly a rack, but you know then that's the up. You you scale up into the you know higher up into the rack. And and you know, I spent my early years designing hardware for those things. And if if something breaks, then you can't get to your data. Right, that's the problem. Again, our jobs protect and store your data. Like not being able to get to your data, that's that's you know we don't want that to happen. And so we designed you know really clever but also costly hardware to do that. And if you, you know, there's a there's a industry term called highly available, you know, active active dual dual. The idea is that if any one thing breaks, there's another thing, there's another path to get to your data. And that's how forever all storage worked, all enterprise storage. You know, you'd have these dual paths, and 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 that gave pretty reliable storage. Uh, the some of the big CSPs now, in about geez, I'm probably thinking 20, 15, 20 years ago. I'm getting old, so it's, it's hard to remember the time. Somebody said, you know what? We have so much data. We have there's so much data that we have. There's no way we can put it up in we can store it in one of these scale up infrastructures. We're going to have to go out. We're going to scale out between the racks, and and so they started you know writing clever software that would allow you to get to data that was located in in across many racks or even different geographies, and if you think about what that means, it actually fundamentally changed what it means to have hardware. Because in the old days, if if any one thing failed and that caused you to not be able to get to your data, well, that's that's a failure, right? That's a that's a problem. But in this new world, because there's so many there's copies across racks, all of a sudden it wasn't such a big deal if one thing failed because you had copies of it in other places. 
And so instead of having to have this really expensive, carefully designed hardware, uh, we started to evolve into this much lower cost infrastructures. And that's driven the just the cost of storage just down amazingly, orders of magnitude. Uh, even in the last decade, we've seen orders of magnitude decrease in the cost of storage. And that's really what's happened is, it, is the scale out architectures have allowed the cost to come down. Costs coming down have allowed the amount of data being stored to go up. And that's allowed us in turn to do more interesting things with the data. So you think about being able to store more and do more interesting things with your data. Are you thinking of things like AI, machine learning? What kind of things do you see more data makes business results or innovation and outcomes even better? Well, you know, this is such a cool area. And, you know, like I said, I'm a long-term nerd and I, you know, I, my, my hobbies are all around this kind of, uh, this kind of infrastructure. And, you know, you, you, We're all long-term a, nerds in this yeah. industry. <laughs> yeah. There's like ra- raspberry pies all over my office and, you know, <laughs> A little, yeah, a little, yeah, a little pie day, a little, you know, there's a, there's a ESP32, you know, there's always going, <laughs> I just got a new soldering iron. I was excited. Uh, <laughs> but uh, let me give an analogy. So, you know, we've been, we've been collecting video surveillance data for, for decades, but 50 years, maybe more than that. But up until relatively recently, the only way to get value from that was to have a person watch the video, right? To have a person look at the video, watch it and decide what happened. Well, now the computers can watch the video. And oh my gosh, does that open up just this incredible amount of, of sometimes scary, but also very interesting applications, you know, because now you can do things, not only can you say, hey, you know, did somebody, uh, you know, come into that scene, but you can say, did they, you know, did they, did they look at this food item in the aisle at the grocery store, or did they, um, you know, you can, you can look at what they're doing, you know, uh, somebody's uh, got a store now where there's no people in the store, they just, you know, the cameras just look and see what you put in your cart, and they charge your credit card, and, you know, really interesting. That's happening in literally every field. Uh, it's just amazing. You know, every time I talk to somebody new, I'm just blown away by 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 the, the cool new ideas. You know, oil and gas, you know, when they get a new algorithm, they'll run all their old data through the new algorithm. It's really um the, the the whole genomics world and the medical world, they're they're doing uh, amazing things. Factories, you know, we we apply um, employ AI in our own factories. You know, we're a very high volume manufacturer. We make uh, multiple drives a second. And, you know, we take pictures, for example, of the, of the, of the heads that we make them out of like a wafer process and they're, they're going by so fast. No human could look at them. So we have a computer look at them and they're pretty clever, right? They, they're really good at telling whether, uh, you know, whether a head is manufactured properly or not. Every segment, every business is, is doing this. And, you know, instead of computers making data for people, now computers are making data from other computers. And that's the real change. As I think about the conversations we've been having about making data affordable, making it accessible, the innovation that can occur. One of the big gaps as we look forward, and this is certainly an area that Hammerspace, the company which I work for, is focused on, is how do you make that data available to the applications, the machines, or the humans that need to use it when it's a distributed world? People are working remotely. Maybe some of the applications you want are in the data center. Others are in a cloud. Can you talk a little bit about Seagate's approach to that, thinking about distributed environments, distributed infrastructure, remote employees. How are you helping to solve that with with your approach? I think there's a good truth to the saying that uh, all clouds are hybrid clouds. In the early days, there was this notion, oh, hey, maybe we'll just everybody will use, you know, uh, some centralized cloud for everything. And if I look at how that's played out, uh, people are distributing their data. They're putting it where they need it. Right. So some data goes up in the cloud. A lot of data goes up in the cloud, but some data stays at the edge. Um, some data I don't want to go to the cloud. Uh, some data I need to, you know, to share with my, you know, with my team in in China or in in Japan, and so I've got to, you know, have it accessible to them. Uh, there's kind of two interesting things here, and they're they're, they're a little bit um, opposing factors. So, big data wants to be object, right? I, I, that's my opinion. I think that big data really it lives well in object because it's globally addressable, and the the metadata aspect of an object store is is really useful for you know for large sets of data and you can you, know, you can go and look at the data then you can you can tag it and you can put that tag in there and it lives with it it's really it's really positive on the other hand most of the applications are still file based applications you know you look at you look at a lot of the cool software for media entertainment you look at a lot of the interesting stuff and they're all file based and so there is this tension between you know the the big, huge lakes of data are really amenable to an object store kind of infrastructure, but the but the cool stuff that uses the data is is still um, 
uh, very often it needs a file world. And so, you know, that, that, that translation, I think has been hard for a lot of people and it's, 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 um, uh, it's been a challenge for, for IT professionals. You know, I've been I, probably to many of the same conferences and customers that you're thinking of in the back of your head. And one of the big things I'm seeing a lot this year, and it's not brand new, but it's really prevalent is the idea of metadata driven workloads and whatever the industry calls it using that, that the intelligence of metadata, not only to know what you have, but be able to drive where should it sit? How do you want that data behave is becoming such a huge focus for industries. And, and what we're seeing is, is because humans just can't manage it anymore. You can't say, I know I need this project in this location and therefore I will move it. You need to automate a lot of that business. Is that a lot of what you're seeing, whether it's file or object, that, that this intelligent metadata is a big piece of the solution? Oh, it's, it's huge. You know, it's not what the data is that you care about. It's what it, it's what it means. Right, you want to know what the data means, and I remember. So this is probably geez, ten years ago now. I was out at um, uh, this company called Digital Globe there in Colorado, and you know they they did these high resolution satellite photos, and I was out their data center uh, talking to them, and and there's you know a bunch of a bunch of racks spinning away, and I said, what's that? And they said, that's a high resolution picture picture of the Earth, right? And you know my eyes just got big. I'm like, I'm like, how much of the Earth? Like the whole actual Earth, right? Like everything we got's right there, and it blew me away that you could that I could in, in the span of my vision, see that much data. And then today, of course, right. I can fit that in like a little, a for you one meter box. I can fit it in twice. You know, <laughs> it's, um, it's, it's just shocking. And, and when you get to scales like that, there's just no way you can manage it unless, unless you're, you're managing the management, right. Unless you're managing the meta information that that's, what's important. You want to know, you know, you want to know what, what's there and you want to know, you know, in the case of pictures, like, you know, which, um, which pictures have rivers in them or which places have houses. And like, it's that meta information that's actually the extractable value, not the raw information. The raw information is so big, no human and not even any company can really conceive and, and, and you know, crunch through it. That makes a ton of sense as far as knowing what is in the data and then figuring out what you're going to do with the data. So a big piece of what Hammerspace would do in that case is maybe you only want to move the data that has um, images of rivers in it to somewhere else. You could take that metadata and say, don't move the entire globe image, but just move the rivers to, you know, a weather forecasting institute or whatever it is that they wanted to have it. And so you can be a little more careful because moving that data around is still tough, right? The, the speed of networks has not grown at the pace of a storage device is my understanding. Oh yeah, you know, it's, um, what's that old saying? Like the, the highest bandwidth connection in the world is like a UPS truck full of tapes. You know, it's, uh, you know and, and, and data, data has gravity. That's the way I think of it is that data is the thing with the gravity and, you know, compute's actually not the thing with the gravity. You know, you can, you can, you can, you know, light up compute, you know, somewhere near a waterfall with cheap energy and, and that's just fine. But that data has got its own, its own energy. And you, you know, really, if you're going to think about having huge and huge amounts of data, where you put it, it's really important. Yeah. Where you put it is important. And then, you know, working with metadata instead of the actual data, which is more nimble, it's smaller, is a lot easier for you to move metadata around and make it accessible than all of the data itself. So, so kind of thinking about that, the, let's talk a little bit about the edge. I, you can't pick up a business publication, heck, even the Wall Street Journal now and not hear about edge and sensors and all of the data coming off cars and things like that. Um, where does that play in? How do we capture that and integrate it into this equation of computers having access to the data they need and even deciding which data to keep out of the edge? That's an area where we spent a lot of energy thinking about it. So for actually for quite a long time, I think we were quite early in, in identifying that the edge was going to be important. And you know, again, it's the whole notion that data has gravity. So if you're creating enormous, enormous amounts of data, you know, uploading everything to a cloud is just not practical. Um, you know, there's, there's a, there's a latency issue. It's just, it doesn't make sense. You've got to have appliances at the edge that look at that data and decide what, what should go into a more centralized repository. Right. So, you know, you want it, you want it, you want it to think about it, right. And you only want, for example, like here's an easy example, uh, video cameras, again, th for many years now, video cameras are smart enough to only record when there's motion. Right, and there's a chip inside the video camera that decides that. If they had to send every frame of data that a video that they took up to some cloud and have the cloud decide whether there was motion or not, that would be an unsustainable 
um, arrangement. And you know, you that analogy works for almost every industry is that when you collect all this data at the edge, you want to think about it and then you want to choose what goes up to a more centralized location for, you know, more sophisticated processing, et cetera. But it's a really it's still it's fascinating because the data is being created at the edge, right? The data is not being created in a central place, it's being created everywhere. Largely. Yeah, yeah. As you think about kind of just some recommendations, um, if you were an IT administrator or a CTO of a company trying to figure out what technologies to be investigating and looking at for the next couple of years, where would you have them start? I mean, we've talked about cloud a lot. Um, You know, we've certainly talked about storage and the need to grow in capacity. Where where do you think people should be researching, really thinking for the next couple of years? The two words that come to my mind for that question are uh, standardization and scale. So if you if you want to uh, reduce the cost of your data storage, standardizing on some kind of RESTful interface, uh, like an S3 kind of interface, is going to be very important, right? Everybody should basically talk to the storage in the same way. And then as you build it out, if you if you build these scale out systems, they're they're essentially much less expensive, right? So you can you know you can you can really uh, reduce the cost of your storage if you scale out and you know just kind of look into the future. You know we've had a breakthrough at Seagate with these with these uh, heat assisted drives, the hammer drives. They actually use a laser to heat up a very small amount of the media for a, like a nanosecond, and it allows us to write data in much tighter groups. And so, you know, we're testing 30 terabyte drives in our lab right now. It's, it's just amazing. The drives are going to keep getting bigger. And so, you know, the other thing to think about is that, you know, in the old days, you know, a storage element was was small, you know, a couple hundred megabytes, something like that. Now, you know, if a drive is, you know, right now we're shipping 20s. Um, 22s are right around the corner, 30s are in the lab, like it's getting bigger and bigger. Your system needs to think about that. And your system needs to think about having these storage elements that are, that are, you know, tens of terabytes. Uh, I don't, I don't see it slowing down. So the architectures really need to think about that and keep up. Nearly every podcast guest we've had on Data Chain has brought up standards in some ways. And everybody thinks about them a little differently. Ari Berman from BioTeam, one of the life sciences organizations that was on was talking about standards across um, the researchers that if you're working on, you know, COVID variant testing in different countries in Africa, they all have a different workflow that they're using and it makes it difficult to share. And then, you know, somebody on the more of the storage side might be thinking about interfaces. Um, Others might be thinking about standards across data access, Um, you know, like maybe government regulations to patient records, things like this. But it's interesting that the standards seem to come up on every level of the workflow in this conversation that people want to share data and they see the value in if they could share data. And there's a a number of things that we as an industry and as technologists need to overcome. And it is making it so that the infrastructure is standardized, the workflows are standardized, maybe the regulations are a bit more standardized because we're still holding ourselves back from holding, getting the true value of data until we solve this. So, you know, there's too many bumps that we're still running into. So I find it interesting that it just keeps coming up over and over again. Think about it like money or language. You know, it's really helpful that we both are speaking English right now, right? Because if you were speaking one language, I was speaking that we wouldn't get in that. But that's exactly how a lot of the storage is architected, right? Some are in SAN and some is that, some is block. And, and you know, th- there's all these different these different languages. And it's, it's very inefficient to try to go between them, right? You have to go to a translator. And that, that is no good. Um, you know, the idea that everybody talks to an API, like, like, a you know, like S3 API, that, that allows you to scale in the back end in a way that you could just never do if people are not talking the same language to their storage. Yeah, absolutely. And I also think the scale component is important. Um, when you and I were chatting ahead of time for this podcast episode, one of the components that came up was, and I, you mentioned it, but I'm just going to highlight it again, that it's interesting to have devices and systems and architectures that scale, but we have to constantly drive down the price of that scale too, that it, more data is being created, more needs to be stored so that we can make these interesting data insights. And if we aren't driving down cost constantly, um, we're going to have a losing battle there. And I think that's a really important point where Seagate's innovating as well as keeping up with that curve. Yeah. You know, ultimately the cost per byte has to keep going down for people to keep buying more. 
and you know that's that's the uh, and of course it's got to be it's got to be secure and it's got to be it's got to be um, you know it's got to be both secure from a from a people looking at it point of view like actual security and it's also got to be resilient uh, secure from a not losing the data and not being able to get it kind of point of view and so you know you have to keep those two things in mind but with those with those bars set you just t- the price has to keep you know driving down and you know just to give an example I remember when I just first started at Seagate so about ten years ago you know a state of the art scale out cloud system used um, I'm going to say, I'll probably get it wrong, I'm going to say one terabyte drives, and we generally had a computer, we had a server for every 12, right? We had like a 2U12 kind of pizza box with a server in. So there was 12 terabytes for every compute element in there. Today, I'm shipping, you know, uh, my big JBODs and Core Vaults that are 106 20 terabyte drives, so more than two petabytes for each compute scale. So, you know, that, I mean, think of the difference between, uh, between you know, 10... Um, 10 terabytes and and 2,000 terabytes, right? It's more than an order of magnitude. Amazing change in really a short time, and and that's going to keep going, right? I think one of the messages is that you know when we look, we're going to keep increasing the densities. We're going to keep increasing the value of these of these boxes so that you can store more and more in a small space for a, a good cost. Things are changing, evolving so fast. Um, it's it's kind of hard to keep up, and you know some of us who work in the industry or have the luxury of this is our day job to keep track with all these trends. Maybe as we tie up, I'd ask you, where would you point the audience as like your favorite readings, your favorite places, as areas of reference as you're thinking about the innovation and where it's going? Where do you think people should keep an eye on just to know what's going on in the industry and how to plan for it? You know the the, pl- the place that I spend a lot of my time is on the compute and AI side, right? I am fascinated by these ever smarter algorithms that are looking at data and getting value from them. And ultimately, I believe that drives the need for for storage. Uh, I think that we're in the very infancy of the world of, of computers looking at data and making decisions that people find useful. I think we're just at the very beginning. And, you know, I tried to teach my videos. So I have horses, right? So I have two brown horses and one tan horse. And I spent like the last month. I have a brown horse too, incidentally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I spent like last <laughs> month trying to t- teach my computer to tell the difference between the two horses and then let me know when one of them walks into another area, right? And it's hard. I'll tell you what. I mean, I'm not a very good programmer, but like, like things like that are on the menu now. And it's just it's just amazing. So you know, I mean, I look, I, I read a lot of the a lot of the blogs. I listen to uh, HBR all the time, which is a good good podcast. Um, but the you know the area that I that I that I watch a lot um, for storage is what's happening in the compute because I think that the I think that the world is going to continue to change. I mean, we're already seeing sort of like kind of quirky and sometimes boring value, you know, like, uh, I don't know, Amazon warehouses are, 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 uh, are, you know, the stocking locations are figured out by a computer now and they don't make any sense to a person, but they're, they're efficient. You're seeing, you're seeing things like that happen, but I, I think we're just in the beginning. I, I think that the real revolution is, is, is still upon us. And you know, as the computers get more powerful and the storage gets bigger, uh, that combination is is really going to change the world we live in, right? It's gonna it's gonna change how uh, how we live our lives every day. Absolutely. Hey, Eric, this was a really interesting conversation. Thank you so much for taking the time to join Data Unchained. Are there any parting thoughts that you want to share that you feel like we should have talked about? Well, it's been a pleasure, and I really appreciated talking to you. And um, this is an interesting field, and I, I think that we're just at the beginning of some uh, really large and interesting changes in the in uh, in the world. It's exciting to get the opportunity to speak like with folks like yourself and work with companies like Seagate. Um, you know, Hammerspace and Seagate just did a training this morning as partners. And it's fun to see all the innovators coming together and thinking about how we can work together to solve some of these problems. Um, definitely when I talk to end users, they're looking to us to help point them in the right direction because they have their own businesses to run. They have to figure out how to do visual effects or genomics research or whatever, video surveillance, whatever it is. So I love when companies are willing to invest the time and conversations like this to help the users kind of distill down some of these trends. So thank you again for your time. Molly, thank you very much. Thanks for listening to Data Unchained, powered by Hammerspace. To learn more, visit hammerspace.com. If you have a guest you would like to hear on the show, email me at molly at hammerspace.com.